and then I, and then it's not funny. I'm always laughing at the wrong things. And um, my, <laughs> my partner is like so critical of this. Okay, but, but bear with me. I don't think it's that bad of a, of a problem to have. I mean, <laughs> like my dad dies and the pool table is in the house. And my friend who played Trump in the videos and then played the snake man, who's like my go-to like white guy, who's always in my films. He's like, Bex, if you want me to, I'll come up to Massachusetts and we can finally make that scene. And I was like, I can't do that. You know, like I was like, I can't, I wasn't ready for that, you know. So when you do your, okay, since you're, since you're in all these different materials and you're doing ceramics and you're drawing and you're videoing, do you have do you start with the drawings and then go to ceramics or is it just kind of does it ch interchange all the time or you know do you do like um do you do a drawing of her first and then it, make her or it's it's interchangeable but it's really it it but it's it makes it it's not necessarily it's a great question. It's not necessarily any kind of like straight line for me. Um, sometimes I'm in a mood to do a lot of drawing and I do a ton of drawing um, before I do a shoot. I'm trying to think of an example. Like, well, this is an example. Like I was like, oh, we're going to tie Trump up to a tree and have him um, with brownies coming out of his mouth after I cast a butt and put it on his butt face, uh, put it on his face, right? Which I did. And it was like kind of after that ceramic butt, you know, but that ceramic butt I made years ago. But then I said, oh, that would be super funny to cast a butt and put it on his face and then have him um, with brownies coming out of his mouth. I mean, because that's kind of how I see Trump, you know? Um, and we fed him a taco bowl and like my my video assistant who was my old college student was from mexico and i was like i know that you were just going to assist me but i thought what if we stick a taco bowl in his face and um and she was like oh my god i would love to do that and and she's like my mother has an altar where she um has a trump character and she and she does stuff to it every day on the altar and i was like yes you know, so it's like, this is how I think, you know, and it's like, you know, these are, these are Puritans in an unmarked grave. These are, these are made totally uh, hand built, you know, there's no, there's no um, molds being used, but it's weird how like, okay. I, are these, are these just like stoneware? Is that just, oh, wow. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. I skipped ahead. Let me go back to that because this is actually a cool thing to do as well. This, this is just regular stoneware. I mostly use smooth clay because I like, um, you know, I don't really like the grog that much. I feel like I end up using a lot of color, but I, in this case, I thought this would be very beautiful to leave them colorless because it's like, it really gives you that feeling of death, but also the history of, of sculpture and of even marble sculpture and ceramics that, you know, the white shows off all the shadows as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just put a clear glaze on it. It couldn't be simpler in, in terms of the, you know. Yeah, but I mean, also because, you know, you have your, your building and I mean, what what is, you know, simple for you is for us as viewers, um, it's different. So, I mean, you know, when you're carving those lines and adding those piece, oh, perfect. <laughs> um, oh, that's a great, oh, that's a nice, that's a, yeah, that's a nice manageable size, but still there's some intricacies that are, you know, happening here. Um, and are you carving when it's like leather hard or soft or any of those things have you found works better for you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think like at this point, see, I know, I know I jump around, but like, okay. we like it. it keeps us, keeps us on our toes. Um, because I was gonna like make this little thing. I, I made this little thing um, yesterday to kind of show you. So basically, this is my lady dog sculpture, okay? So I'm gonna make like the head 
and are you working you on like what, you, what is that that it's sitting on is that like foam or just some kind of cutting board oh what do you use? oh it's we want to know everything cheesy. yeah it's so cheesy because i'm here at my studio where i also sew and it's so bad like i just took my um my cutting board that i use for sewing and i stuck a ceramic on it i mean <laughs> I'm wicked. I'm wicked. Not mature. I'm not mature. Um, no, that's okay. That's. I mean, the times we're living in with studios are. It's. It's a little complicated these days. So that's all right. You got to work with what it's you have. I was going to say that's what I would have done. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like I know that I can clean it. You know, I know that I can clean it off. Um, but yeah, I made. Have you guys been making? Um, you've been making some slabs. I heard. Also, do you work a bit with coils or pinch pots at all? So what we've done so far is we've been um, ex exploring pinching, um, coiling, and just started to explore slab as well. Uh -huh. So we're kind of, they're all sort of on the cusp of that right now as we're moving. Cool. We just finished all of our pinching and um, experiments and now we're sort of diving a little bit deeper into the coiling and soon to the slab. So Very yeah. nice. A little bit of everything. So I made the legs and arms here as coils. And, you know, of course, I shaped them and things. And the body is a is two pinch pots put together, right? The, the boobs are also pinch pots. Of course, I don't even use these words when I'm when, for my own classes. And then I'm a visiting artist and I'm like a potty mouse. So I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm a terrorist. Um, so, um, so are you doing that because you want to make sure that you're, so you're hollowing everything. So yeah, like her, her, it's important, her like, hollow and it's important that, okay. So like this pinch pot, it, it, this is hollow. And then I stick a hole in it somewhere where it doesn't matter. Usually I do a lot of line work. I love these tools. I don't know if you have these, t this tool, but to me, this is the tool. Okay. My, it looks like a dental tool. Yep. You know, yeah, exactly. And the, like, I love drawing into the clay with this thing. And so, so something to note about these pinch pot boobs, it, I don't think that's the, it's not even a cool word for it, but whatever. So these breasts, um, I did, I slipped and scored the breasts on, but I put a hole in the body first and then i put a hole in it where there would be a hole in a breast so i think about things like that as i go i don't do it later because i will forget right so um but i just redid that because i was like okay just in case i forget um so i'm gonna make like a head and you know if i was making this figure bigger which i often do I would have to make those legs hollow, right? Mm -hmm. And please keep interrupting me though, too. Like if you end up with a question or you want to make a comment, like this is not all about me. This is just like, you know. Yeah, I, I was wondering if you could like uh, either find the tool or like send a link to the tool that you were presenting. I mean, no, I think you're going to have to Google that. I mean, this is like. I'll find uh, it. I'll okay. Find, I'll find it for you, Morgan. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, but thank the, you. Yeah, I think that tool is that's my favorite tool, and the tools that you use really do matter because um, it just makes it so much easier as you go along. Like having the two things on either end for me, I don't have to like lift up another tool the whole time. You know, there's other tools that I use and that a lot of people use, but like. I could literally just do everything with this tool, you know, and I, I love it. And, and that's the thing is like, just making it easier, easier for yourself. And, um, and, you know, I like, I generally like the white clay because I, I like bright colors. So I like to glaze with bright colors, but of course the terracotta can be very beautiful as a skin tone as well. And so sometimes, I use that um, if I'm making um, a person with darker skin tone and then um, and then I, I like to use the terracotta but or if I if I want to have it as an undertone and and put the glaze on top 
top and intentionally have that brown, that very warm orangey brown showing through, right? So, so you know, if I have a pinch pot that I, I jam together like this, and then I can start to already form it into like, I'm making like a dog headed girl because um, that's one of the characters in my latest film. Um, so basically, so, so just kind of seeing what, just like repeating what I'm seeing you do. So you made the, the pinch pot and then you, you, form, you formed it into a sphere after you slipped and scored, right? And then you're starting to um, use the air in there to kind of push and then sculpt the face, right? Right, yeah, so like so I'm not, I'm not poking a hole in it yet because I'm letting it kind of set up as I work on it. Um, so, you know, I don't even know if this is like the most helpful, helpful part of it for you guys, or if it's more helpful that just to be seeing like the different kinds of things that can be made. But, um, you know, I like to think about the functionality of these objects in terms of like, I've made a lot of pieces that have removable heads that slot into a hole. I mean, so like you can do that kind of thing too. Um, and here, I have one here. So I'm going to, I'm going to just attach the head on this dog lady today, but you know, you can, you can do things like this too. So, you know, you begin to see how, how you can make things like I made this piece where I made the whole piece on a slab. And then I let that I let this set up for a while before I attach the feet to the slab at the bottom of her dress. Right. And, you know, did you attach them when, when um, you had the figure lying down? Or, um, not really, I just let it set up and get like, not even leather hard, but just a little bit less than leather hard. And, okay. then, and then I made the feet while this was getting dry. And then when, and then I put the feet on and, and really set her down on the feet just right. at the right time when it was just dry enough to do that. That way it was really like the weight of her was also helping that bond between the legs and the body, right? Yep. So, um, so when you're working with clay, you have, you, you're really waiting for certain things to dry. Like I made this body last night to put the head on to show you guys that, but it's also what I would do anyway, because the body has set up just enough that I can then attach a, a little bit wetter head to it and it will hold that head. So right. did you leave it to dry overnight or was it still wrapped up like No, I wrapped it up. I wrapped it up in this. I am really cautious about drying things slowly. Um I'm not building things. I also build things a bit chunkier than um many than some ceramicists do. I know that like people want to achieve this thinness, but I, I always feel like um, it's just not rough and tumble enough for me. Like I, I, I want there to be like a little more structure to these pieces because, you know, I tend to put them into installations and, you know, they're a part of something larger and I don't, I feel nervous about them being too, you know, too thin, too fragile. I don't want like too many like little tiddly bits that are sticking out that that could fall off especially yeah. you just like get I extra was, insurance that way so just... yeah and also because i'm traveling back and forth like i don't know what your situation is now you're probably working close by the kiln and it's not as much an issue but i will say that my being cautious about drying time and like wrapping it sometimes with two or three of those um you know it's like stuff that you get at the dry cleaners okay. and that's so much better than like a, a really bulky um hard plastic bag um it just it's just much better for i don't know it just wraps it much better and 
when I made the the house piece, it it really I dried that thing so slowly because I saw that it even started to warp a bit, right? So I stopped it from warping by, you know, I would have to cover it not only with um, sometimes they say cover things with with um, paper towel, but I even covered it with this um, cloth mesh. What was that called? It's like. Um, what is it called? They Tool? wrap a turkey. They'll wrap a turkey with it. Oh, okay. cheesecloth. Cheesecloth, exactly. I wrapped it with wet cheesecloth and then put the plastic on on top of that. And that really helped um, slow down the drying process quite a bit. And it kept it pliable for me to be able to work on it for a few months because I really wanted to put the different details into it and then I made that, oh, and the dad head that comes out of the chimney, that's a separate piece too. So I was able to make a separate piece that could go inside of it. There were, I, I have several dogs that come out the windows. I think that's more in the back of the sculpture. So, you know, so I, I, I really like things that are um, in multiples in that way, like that, that um, things that slot together, that go, you know, that there's multiple pieces that make up one piece. Okay, sorry to interrupt again. Um, but oh, please interrupt. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry, Zoe. Um, I know you talked about Morgan. like the like the structure. Do you find that stoneware clay is like more structurally sound for you? Like it can hold up a lot and deal with a lot more. A lot more than like than what like than porcelain. Uh, right now we're working with like earth earthenware clay. So like, I'm I'm just curious like what your experience is with like stoneware earthenware. earthenware. Uh, well, now that you say stoneware versus earthenware, I mean, I thought you were saying stoneware versus uh, porcelain or something. Um, what is it? I mean, I'm using sculpture clay. I'm using smooth bodied high fire clay. I'm using high fire because what? We are we are we are a low fire, low to mid fire. Okay. Uh, but right now, but yeah, but right now we're working with a a terracotta earthenware clay that has a lot of great plasticity to it. Um, however, okay. we and really it's really holding form form well. However, it does easily kind of want to crack and 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 dry. So one thing we have been working with is spraying down paper towels to wrap around our pieces and huh? then plastic bags around them to to kind of give them a chance like you're saying for them to sit up right and during the process and that's a lot of what we're kind of working with with this clay awesome. but i mean you know i think that um i was working for years with a low fire clay as well and um and using do you guys use like um uh, under glazes as well as glaze, or do you, do you or do you do you make your own glazes there? We are going to be. We do not make our own glazes, but we will be doing some under glaze. But we're working out with commercial glazes. Yeah. Yeah, oh. I love I love like Amico's velvet under glazes. I use them in everything that I do, and I, and those go low fire and high fire. So what I love about that is that if I switch kiln environments or clay bodies, I can mm -hmm. use my my under glazes at least. Um, but the clay studio that I was teching at a clay studio all of last year and, and in exchange to, to make my pieces and they mostly did high fire. So seeing that like they, they did, they turned over the high fire kiln so much more frequently. Um, I started to experiment with high fire and at first I wasn't getting the colors that I wanted. And then I found out about a zinc based glaze that I could use um, to really amp things up. Oh, am I, sh I haven't been looking at the chat. Did, did we just get any questions <laughs> chat or that was well, just- no, I, would, I would prefer you guys all just to like unmute yourself and to ask a direct question just cause it can get lost. And cause you, well, cause you're using your hands. You can't really be- uh, Yeah, I'm really- my play And then over here and yeah. Um, um, but yeah, oh, the- I can't. Was, was there a question in the chat? Sorry, is it okay if I interrupt for a second? Please, Zoe. Hello. 
Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I was actually hoping to jump back to something that I heard you say earlier. Oh, sure. um, and like, please like correct me too. Like if I um, like misunderstood or like I'm misquoting you at all. Um, but oh, sure. I heard you say like talking about like this idea of like functionality and ceramics and specifically that like intersection of functionality and storytelling. Uh-huh. Um, I guess I'm just curious to hear more than about, I think like your notion of what a functional object is then within your work, because I know that that's something that I try and think I've been trying to think about a lot more like within my own work is uh-huh. um, how can functional objects still represent that function, but also represent a place within a narrative, either through like qualities of that object or through removing it from its intended context. And I guess it's just interesting to see how storytelling is still playing into the functionality of your work, especially in terms of like the removable heads and how that kind of like functions on its own. And so I would just like to hear more, I guess, about your, again, like idea of um, like functionality within your work and specifically how you feel like that crosses over with storytelling as a medium. Yeah, yeah. I'm grabbing this one piece because as you asked that, I'm staring at this piece that really is a prime example. Um, That's what's kind of fun about being at the studio. I don't know if it makes it more interesting to see it, see these things IRL or not, but it's kind of fun. I miss IRL, (laughs) IRL (laughs) life. Um, Yeah, so this uh, piggy bank bride that I made was one of the first... um, bride sculptures that I made. Right. And, um, and that's where I was thinking about this idea of, of function, like that she's a really a piggy bank. And that I actually thought about how I did not make at the bottom a way to get the coins out. And so the coins just go in and they don't come out. Right. So, um, Let's see, I can get her groom too. Her groom is pretty cool. Hopefully I won't mess him up with my clay hands. Um, you know, so this is um, Mega Bucks groom and, uh, and the uh, piggy bank bride. And, you know, it's like kind of funny to think about how like short the you know I made him purposely smaller more diminutive than the goddess uh was uh I also thought about sort of the corruption of wealth and it's kind of interesting right now where we see people um checking out Trump's taxes and seeing that he's not quite what he thought what we thought he was or maybe we all a lot of people know what he was but you know, he's not worth as much as uh, he acts like he is. And so it's actually very similar to what I was thinking about. Those are actually Uh, really funny when you think about it. Because a lot of the time, we we, like, the store we're used to is like, the dude's going to be the provider. But me and my my friends went on a walk the other day, we heard these two dudes talking about how they're mooching off this guy's girlfriend because she has all the, the subscriptions the Wi-Fi, like literally everything she provides herself. Right. That, you know what, that's so um, contemporary, isn't it? Like, oh man, I'm using her Netflix, you you know? (laughs) Wow, I'm really getting over, you know? It's like, yeah. Yeah, I remember my boyfriend getting very excited when I presented the idea of like just us splitting checks or like him buying one meal and then me buying the next meal and like things like that and he was just like mind blown and I was just like isn't this how it should be (laughs) I mean I have no idea how it should be at this point because I don't know that we're in any kind of normal economic situation at this point you know what I'm saying so it's like well now it's a free for (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Time to yeah, survive. yeah. If, if somebody if somebody made money that week, they might be the one paying for dinner. You know, um, not to be bleak, but you know, um, but yeah, I think that it's super interesting. Like the 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 first time I made the removable heads too, I made a trophy bride that I had removable sports ball heads as her head. So she had one normal head. But then she had 
soccer and tennis and football, basketball. And I, I put the peg, I made a wooden stand for it. And I had the, the pegs in the wooden stands around uh, at the, you know, as the base. And you could play it like a game, you know, like you could put the head in according to whatever um, is on TV, what sport is on TV at the time or whatever, right? So like the idea of almost, um, uh, what, what do they call it? Like a football widow, you know, like this idea, like um, the woman who is making, you know, um, oh, yeah, I'm seeing all these great comments pass by. I, I can't touch the screen. So like I see the comment once in a while, but I have claimed uh, someone, someone was just saying that traditionally the man should be the main provider and uh, Zoe responded, hmm, not so sure about that, lol. And I just responded, I'm not exactly traditional. Right. I mean, look, we are not normative. We're not normative at this point in time anyway. And like we're questioning these norms more and more every day. I mean, because by the time like a few generations from now, gender nonconformity will be, will have been, you know, something in place for like more than one generation, right? So then we're gonna see the breakdown of, of this norm core structure being so oppressive and present anyway. We're actually in the process of breaking that down right now in a yeah. way that might be like, might create something so much more interesting and is creating something so much more interesting, you know, um, than ever before. And I mean, and so my work does attack um, heteronormativity, which I, I didn't even know until I recently took this amazing um, anti-racist workshop at the Brooklyn Museum. And I had taken this woman's workshops a couple times before, but it just struck me that we actually interrogated some of these words all at the same time, it, like it, like um, that heteronormativity upholds the values of white supremacy, right? So it's like, you know, this leave it to beaver, I love Lucy kind of, you know, like a 1950s housewife kind of like ideology that most artists have nothing to do with, you know, but it still is a presence in our society, right? So how does that, how does that impact me? I mean, like, like this, you know, this is, has a huge impact on like, why do I even, why do I even um, dress up in costumes and, oh, now I'm like frozen on my screen. Oh, so like, why do I even dress up in costumes and do these wild things? Um, as lobster girl right where which it was like oh i don't know like when i was your age i was like i don't even understand what my own sexuality is like i don't even understand myself as uh the narrator of my own drama right so i literally put myself in these films in order to track myself and in order to be more in control of my own narrative Right. So when we talk about like what comes first when it comes to my work, it I was a painter and a ceramicist way before I made films. But when I started to make films and perform more frequently, what I found was I liberated myself even more so from the, the puritanism that that was within me because I thought, oh, as an artist, I'm supposed to make these objects and I'm supposed to do this or that, right? But in fact, it's all the same thing. And th these are all like my tools to express myself and a way to get free from normativity. I struggle with it because I grew up in a town and I mean, these towns can be the same. You're in Massachusetts right now. I grew up in a place where there were very few people of color. There was, there were a few people in my town who, uh, who my parents were friends with and I was friends with who seemed to be gay looking back, but like they were depressed. They were not allowed to express themselves truly. So it was like, oh, that person's a little more masculine or this man is a little more feminine. And it was maddening to me when I went to RISD 
and found out that this stuff was all a bunch of bullshit. So this is the junk food bride. And this, I cast a lot of uh, kitchen magnets for the outside, made this um, orgy scene on the inside out of um, Sculpey clay. And then years later, made this video. I wasn't thinking of it directly, but the video fuck platter was very much correlated with the, the um, junk food bride where it was like, um, you know, this multicultural orgy scene that I shot here in Bushwick with the artist scene that I'm in, right? So Black Marquis de Sade, right? So the Marquis de Sade is a character in history that was given all this power to be in charge of sexuality, be in charge of um, S&M and all these things. He was an aristocrat. So my whole idea in my work is to take it back and to be like, I grew up working class. I have a right to express myself. And when it comes to sexuality and it's not, I'm not a bad person. I'm not like, uh, you know, who, you know, like persecutor. She's into, uh, into sexuality. The more intellectual you are and you're making statements about sexuality, sometimes the more it comes into question. If it's made to be sexy for the male gaze, that's not questioned. But if you make art that examines sexuality, then that can become um, risque in the world, like Carol H. Name and different artists like this that Emily probably would introduce you to, because uh, I know you you were great friends with her. Uh, yeah. so I go through the same kinds of things where it's like there's nothing here happening, you know, other than me. Actually, it's political for me. It's political, you know. It's it's like. Um, until we can be honest and start talking about some of these things, we can't change the things. You know, what medium is good for what? I don't know. But what I love about clay is that there's a feeling of, um, for me, for the way that I work with it, Americana and um, and folk art and and the idea of storytelling and the idea of how ceramics has always told our story. That's I really that's like so the bride in that sense because it feels like something that you could just have sitting out on display and like have a kid come up and open it and then ask what's going on and like just having that abil ability to then start a conversation. Yeah, and also you could and that like what I love about those hidden pleasures brides because I made several different versions of that idea. Those what I love about it is that the outside looks very innocent and the inside is where you see the surprise. And the innocence is what gets placed on us, is right? Like that we get expected to be a certain way to operate in society, right? Yeah. And then on the inside, um, what gets hidden was ironically, you know, what is a dildo used for but self-pleasure? So the idea of a self-pleasuring bride, self-sustaining, is like almost saying we don't need the other in order to self-sustain if you have self-pleasure, if you have self-love. So it was like just in, in every aspect, the brides uh, are outranking the grooms in the, in the series because it was a, about goddess power. It was really about how... Well, I, well, guess what? I've, I've, I've inspected it and I see that I have everything I need here, you know? Um, and you do too, you know, it's like, whether you're male or female, I'm not anti-male at all. You know, it's like, I am uh, saddled with heterosexuality. <laughs> My thing, <laughs> I'm dealing with heterosexuality <laughs> and, um, and you know, and it's humorous to deal with that sometimes. It, it really is. Um, yeah, it, it's just nice to see because, like, like you, I grew up in a town that was like ten years behind the times. Right. And like one of my black classmates got the police called on her because she was standing out at the bus stop without on the day where like all of the other white kids, including myself, were not there to wait with her. Wow. So it it's just nice to see like this perspective and like this sort of shock value because like I saw that and I heard that growing up and like you're not supposed to do these things you're not supposed to be self-pleasuring you're not 
supposed to love yourself, you have to have a man to do that for you, which is why I'm probably very non-traditional now. Yes, yes. Is because you had, a question, you had a question about that, and that's a lot of artists start out being artists because they are questioning something like that. Yeah, you know? I, I got in trouble at, in Sunday school because I colored Jesus as an ethnic. I gave him the proper skin tone for where he was supposed to be right. coming from. And I got pulled out of class and I got in trouble for it. Yeah. And that is, be that is tricky too. Like um, I created this recently, this um, series of goddess drawings and I was studying goddess culture from across the world. And I was sharing it with, um, with two friends, one friend from India and a friend who's African American. And I said, I have these goddess cards that this white woman made. And I was so disturbed by the fact that she mo she was showing only white goddesses and a few goddesses from way in the past, like one from Mes Mesopotamia, where it's like Mesopotamia doesn't really even exist. You know, it's like now that's a different that's a country. You know what I'm saying? It's like that culture yeah. is so ancient. So it was like wow, she left out so much information. And I think one of the things we're talking about right now that's super important is that we have a whitewashed history. Like, we're, you know, growing up in New England, um, you know, I learned a lot about the Salem Witch Trials before I ever even knew my ancestry because it was that and it was Plymouth Rock and it was Samuel Adams. Like, we, in New England, it was like, Samuel Adams, he threw the tea in the drink he was he was a badass you know it's like it's like the revolution you know and that's fine but it's like we learn regional history and we don't even know that we're learning a regional history in each region in america and that we are putting ourselves above other people in other regions of america and saying we're less racist than the racists in the in the south or something like this this is not helpful you know and it's like so I said, let me let me make a more international set of goddess images. And my friend was like, I don't like the image that you made of Kali. This is not well researched. And, and she said, I, you've got to find a different way to do this. And I was like, wow, yeah, because it's like, who am I to be the author of that too? So it gets super tricky. How do I manage what I'm doing in terms of... Um, in terms of like who I'm doing yeah, well, work. Well, well, I think I think Rebecca, you bring up a good point. And Morgan, what you're talking about is, you know, as artists, how do we how do we take liberties in terms of how we're translating or trying to re-represent or bring out those questions about how we're perceiving our perception on what is true and what is authentic or not, right? Right. Um, and that's a lot about what's going on in society right now is the question of authenticity a lot right now, what, what yeah. is truth, and and how we are portraying, um, in, a, in a sense, even the idea of just memory, right? So how that is translating is, you know, a lot of your work, Rebecca, is this narrative, but a lot of it comes through memory. You know, yeah. uh, you kind of bringing things to a present moment, kind of the memory, the history of, of here to there, making different correlations, making it yeah. past and then present, right? And then kind of and putting yourself as this new narrator on on how we're on how you're identifying and telling your story in in this in this bigger story that we're in together. So right. And then when it comes to in my drawings and in my films, when I'm incorporating characters who who do not share the same cultural background that I have that ha that has been working for me so far in the sense that i'm mainly depicting personal narrative with that right and my personal narrative is that my world is not populated solely by white people right so like for me it was super important to say let me share what my world actually looks like because if every figurative artist who's white only depicts white people it's like that becomes a racism too. Like, like you know, John Curran. It's really great to see his fleshy figures. Um, 
but it's like always the same flesh. And it's like, so I said to myself, let me change that. And, um, and, uh, my partner is black and I've put him in a lot of drawings and, um, and that has become a, a point of consent between us, you know? So like, that's one way that I work. And he was saying like, uh, in response to what you were doing with, um, showing Jesus as his true color, I made a film and made this ceramic object of Virgin Mary. And he was saying, why did you cast this white woman as Virgin Mary in your film? And I'm like, but I had Virgin Mary getting, um, having sex with God in the film because it, it, it like having sex with an invisible character, again, so it was self pleasuring, but it was like, she had sex with God. That's what I think is amazing about Virgin Mary. I said, I'm saying all these things that are, that could be considered very controversial by religious people. Right. I well, live, yeah. I live in a neighborhood that's very, um, religious like there's there's um virgin mary sculptures all around in my neighborhood like in you know in Gordon. yeah it's, it's i mean i feel like brooklyn overall is either it's very italian or very jewish right so i'm on a block that's very old school and i have to say old school italian when i say that because there's there's many italian people that are yes. very different from each other like i'm not here to like narrow it down but this is like a very like you know, Catholic. old school Italian block, I uh, also Polish and like, and there's a lot of Virgin Marys. So I said, listen, I'm not commenting on like what I, I agree with you. Like, this is not, you know, this is a depiction, but I'm actually commenting on that depiction itself. I'm like, I'm like counteracting that because I'm living here thinking it was cool at first. There's a, I love the Virgin Mary. And I love these sculptures. I love grottos. I'm a sculptor. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm like, I made I'm a grotto. A I made a grotto for the the that hill in the back where I'm sticking her. You know, so I love it. But at the same time, what I realized is that that neighborhood that I live in is very. There's a lot of racism that's happening there, and I didn't notice that until my boyfriend moved in with me, and I was like, God damn it, I felt like this is a totally uh, maybe Great. boring maybe it's a boring block to live on but like quiet and then it was like oh god i have misjudged this situation so well, they're very very traditionalist i guess we could kind of say their perspective is very traditional um, yeah. and they are protective of their homes and um i lived in brooklyn for a very long time and they would sit outside in their lawn chairs yeah. just making sure they could see who was coming in and out yes so I think people, and that's fear, right? So yeah. I think a lot of it comes down to having this fear of wanting to just kind of, you know, a lot of people who came in from different boats and holding on to their tradition or having a sense of place where they feel like they can relate. And this is something that was on for a long time and they tried to kind of reestablish yeah. that fear. Um, and there was a lot of separation and now things are not. And I think, we're, you know, people are still trying to, you know, train different ways of how we can look and perceive things, right? Yeah. And I think, I think, Morgan, that's, you know, a lot of us grew up hearing certain traditional aspects that were passed down, whether they be true it or not. Um, it's kind of like goes back to the idea of the myth, right? Which is which is all the way back into into folklore and to telling us the idea of these sort of myths that were presented to us and how we told stories. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I, I'm sort of sorry that we took this turn, but I was just really excited to hear that you were including all these, and like even seeing in the photos that you were including all these different people, because uh, my uncle is actually mixed, and I've got a couple of mixed cousins, and like to me, the whole idea of racism, I just couldn't understand it because I just wasn't raised that way, and. It, it's just really pleasing to see someone else taking a step towards this and being like, no, we're going to represent some of these goddesses in different ways, that we are going to show that there is more than one person out there. Yeah, and, and Morgan, I wanted to also share with you then, how did I deal with the criticism that I got from my friend who was like, I don't really like this depiction that you did of a goddess from my culture. 
You know what I did? I had shown her the pictures um, online and then she made those comments. And I, you know what I did? I invited her to my studio for a proper studio visit, showed them to her in real life, asked her for ideas about solutions. And, you know, it, she was so generous when I did that, you know, and like I found, I, and, and yeah, it's going to be a little bit more of a difficult project because I'm not just, you know, commenting on characters that are from my life or, you know, maybe the, the film that I had cast a black man as the Marquis de Sade, nobody minded that I replaced the Marquis de Sade with him, you know, but it, because I was poking fun of European culture by doing that, right? So um, I thought of it as similar, but, uh, you know, similar, like I can, yeah, I'm using icons, you know, and I, and I felt good when I, when I drew the Black Virgin Mary finally, because my partner had been questioning me for months about this white depiction, you know, and he's saying, that's not even true. That's not, and I'm like, I know it's not true. I'm poking fun of this, this myth, you know? Um, so it, it's about conversation and it's about, and it's about like really getting in there and not, and not just assuming anything like, but like really have advisors, like my friend Kenya Robinson, another amazing artist you guys could look up. She said to me at one point, you can't be dating black men without having a black female friend. She's like, you wouldn't know if you have spinach in your teeth. And I was like, oh my God, I love her so much, you know, but it's like, I always like, I, I don't go to her for everything or neither, or my other black female friends, but it's like, that is different to be able to like, really have friendships that can support your break, your breakdown of your own racism. Because even as an anti-racist, we have to break yeah. assumptions that we've that we've gathered for years. Like I just recently read um, White Fragility. Have any of you guys read that? No, no, I, I haven't you guys I've heard of it. It's excellent. I really recommend it. It's you know New York top, Times top ten list or whatever. Yeah, but when the rally started back up again, I legitimately went to like all my friends and I was like, if I have done something that has made you uncomfortable, feel free to call me out on it right now. Like I was it's like, important. I want to have this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. You said, Cause people don't know they're racist most of the time. They like, they just see it as like, Oh, this is just the way I think. Like I, yeah. I'm indigenous and black and I got racism in my family. You can't even bring up a French person to my grandparents or my mom. It yeah. Just, yeah, that, that's pretty much what I asked was like, if there was a time that I ever made you feel uncomfortable or you thought I was saying something racist, like, please call me out on it because I don't want to be that way and I don't want to present myself that way. And like, one, awesome. of my friends, one of my friends like gave me like the biggest reality check ever. And I was like, thank you. And it, it, it was great. It was, it was well, just that's, a great that's conversation. Great. Well, we have to clear the air and to open that way of just a dialogue of with anybody is I'm here to talk about anything and I'm, you know, let's, let's talk. I'm open to an, a conversation. And I think that's kind of what art is really, really wonderful for is art allows us to kind of open up these streams for conversations that we don't know maybe how to address otherwise sometimes. Right. So yeah. kind of, they just do, you know, it's kind of, Oh, well tell me about this. Oh, well, this is really, I mean, art has this way of being an incredible segue um of of language of saying things in different ways that we can then open discussions in a whole different level i think that's one of the best things that art can do for us and is, and is really doing for us at during this time period right yeah and how we're able to make responses and to see and um and really put that translation of this time of history into the world of how it's affecting us i mean more than anybody else right so yeah, and I, I think in, in the um, White Fragility book, the biggest thing that I got from it is that um, what is White Fragility anyway? It's basically defensiveness, right? And like what Emily was saying earlier about this idea of like, you know, of people be having fear and, and they're basically defending their turf, you know, um, because they don't want to lose anything. And in a way, it's like, in a way, me as Yeah, that's, that's essentially how I presented the conversation is like, you can say anything and I'm not going to argue back. I'm just going to listen. Yeah. When you yeah. bring it up and their first instinct is to argue, that's when you know they're suspect. Because <laughs> they, you you're can't like, fathom the idea that yeah. you're wrong. There, it, it, there's this, 
there's a defensiveness of maybe they're, they're not sure where the conversation's going to go. That maybe they also just don't have the answers. Maybe they're not even sure why. You know, we, you know, Rebecca, we discussed this um, today as we're working on our projects about kind of really honing into our intention of our own work and our own skills. Yeah. And how um, when you have a strong intention with your work or where you're going, even if you're not totally sure, but the intention is there, it really helps us to be able to clarify and to have discussions with people about our work and about things that we feel strongly, strongly about. And right. that intention is really the most the best thing that we can be focused for as as they are you know kind of exploring this new material that some of them have never used before but is having a strong intention behind yeah yeah and i think that then when you can defend like they they say that in a critique like this idea uh, because there's terminology that says defending your work right? right defending your work is the antithesis of being defensive, ideally, right? Yeah. Because So it comes into play too in every area. So like, if you find yourself feeling defensive in any area, you just have to, you, you just have to be gentle with yourself and say, say to yourself, you know, hey, I just, I was feeling a little bit defensive there. What am I trying to protect? What am I trying to, what, what is it that made me feel fearful? Or what is it that made me feel you know, sometimes I have even felt this way even recently, like, oh, I might just feel stupid because I didn't know something, right? Um, or I inadvertently said something in a way that, that um, like I've done this many times where I've said something in a way that um, my partner disagrees with. So I'm dealing with this in my personal relationship, you know, and, and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I just said that. Like, I didn't even think that, you know, I didn't, think that was bad or whatever. Like I said, I said something the other day about we've made so much progress since the civil rights movement and the women's movement. And I hate to see this administration tear all that progress down. And he sent me this amazing um, quote by Chris Rock that it's like, you know, you, you don't have, pro there is no progress if um, you're getting beaten less, you're still getting beaten. You know, and it was like that was the essential, the essentials of the quote. It was I, I can send you guys the quote because it was way better than what I'm saying. But it was like that'd be awesome. Thanks. But you know what I mean? I was like, oh shit, yeah. I didn't mean to say that like everything's better now or like that we have like a huge amount of progress that's like hunky dory. I guess I know, I know what you were trying. I know what you were trying to say. I think it's. I think that's also just us wanting to feel that hope that we are as humanity are taking better steps, right? Yeah. Um, and that especially, especially just acknowledging that we can't be responsible for the entire bit of humanity to so not be so hard on yourself, but even us as people becoming, you know, ourselves becoming more and more accepting. Um, yeah. with doing our own levels of self-reflection and self-growth and doing our research as well. All I know is I'm taking the steps to to continue to process, to be more more aware, more reflective, listening yes. better, right? And that's all we can really be at doing right now is focusing yes. on just making sure that we ourselves are doing it first because it's true. I mean, we it can feel like that where it's taking a giant step back for this bigger thing, even if, you know, we've been putting in the work ourselves. So it's it's a very hard it's a very hard place to talk about, I think, and because of that, and people are really struggling with that because yeah. many of us yeah. are really doing everything we can. And we feel like it's it's not enough, right? right? So I think I, but I think I think you know, it's just to keep having these conversations, you know, like what you're saying, Morgan, with the people who are around you and in your life, and being proactive about it, and continuing to be authentic in whatever you're doing is and compassionate is really the best thing to do at this point. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It, and it's it's major because, you know, when I was filming in Salem, you know, my friend, oh, you should, you guys should go take one of his tours. He He's starting to, because he always gives tours outside anyway. So he started to go back to work, but he gives witchcraft tours in Salem. His name is Tom, the tour guide. <laughs> um, <laughs> but Tom, is an amazing male witch he's he's bisexual he's 
anti-racist. He's a super, I think, super I think I cool actually guy. met him once when I was going through Salem on you one met of my him? visits. I, I think so because yeah. I because I was long hair. Long, yeah, because because I was like I was asking like for like the authentic witch shops because I know that there are a couple there because I also practice that so yeah. like so like I think I think I met him because like he gave me recommendations on like which stores to go to. Yeah, he is so awesome, and what he has been saying on his Facebook wall, and I've witnessed it when I was there to some extent as well, so I know it's true. There are people in the witchcraft community who are white supremacists. And then most of the witchcraft community is super anti-racist, super feminist men, super amazing people. But then you've got these people who are like, they studied witchcraft from the perspective of like, I'm only into Nordic traditions, or I'm only into pagan traditions from celtic you know celtic lore or something and they get so deep into that that it it circles back to being you know racist, pretty racist right those would so, be the same people who use white sage to smudge also yeah yes yeah. yeah. so okay. there is a whole movement to decolonize witchcraft i mean and one of the things that was said the other day on um you know it's just a meme that i saw but the meme said you know hey how to decolonize your altar and basically it's like make it yourself you know don't well, i think that's buy a 500 hundred dollar crystal that got mined from some cave and you know yeah I, I i love finding my own rocks like i love going to the beach and like finding quartz and like polishing it up and like because also then you like have that connection and you're putting energy into it and like i really hate that there are so many like white run witch shops out there that really just well it's on like the very classic traditions and aren't right. very open-minded yeah i know and and so morgan that is life unfortunately you know for better or for worse i think that um you know that's i mean that's something that's being really kind of torn across right now is this idea of again authenticity right is that i don't want to have sushi unless it's given to me by someone from Japan, I don't, you know, this and that. And I'm, I'm bringing that to a lighter, in a lighter direction because I think that what's most important is just, I mean, is to have authenticity within yourself and the intention, yeah. no matter what, especially as an artist, one of the most important things is having that authentic voice, which is yours. Um, and really understanding who you are and who you are in the world. Because art is not, it's not meant, though we spend a lot of time isolated making our work, it's really about the art being in the world. And it really comes to life when we have discussions and we, we meet with other artists, or like Rebecca was saying, how she brought that person to, over to her studio and had a really great discussion about this piece that she made. And those are the things that as artists really kind of get us making it feel alive in that this understanding and that this, this quest that we're on or this, these intentions of these ways that we're working are really come alive. Um, yeah. You know, it, I don't know, Rebecca, that's how you feel, but it, yeah. it really, I mean, it really is as much as I love, you know, doing solo shows, I love being in group shows because I really loved, you know, meeting the other artists, seeing, you know, being around their work, seeing the perspective. Yeah. Um, it just, to me, it was one of the really, really the best parts because I think when we work with other artists, we we kind of remind ourselves about how important it is to kind of own and own and honor your own voice, and what we learn from each other, and how we respect. You know, we see these different ways, all these perspectives and viewpoints of I yeah. can never make work. You know, Rebecca and I make work completely different. You know, but there's, um, you know, but we honor each other at the different levels of, of what each of us do for different reasons. And yeah. I think it's really so, you know, so supportive of artists and how artists need to be supported together in our own. No, and, and, say, and speaking on that, Emily, it's like, you know, I really love the pieces that you've done where you where you take the. Um, the lines that are in the middle of the road and make that into sculpture and make that into this like wild, like curvy, curvilinear public art. And it's like, I can't even go on a walk and see public art out, you know, out on the street without thinking about those pieces. You know, it's like, that's just so 
that's just taking up so much great space in the world too, you know, and it's like, that's very, very dissimilar to what I do. It's like, there's, um, you know, I, I'm so interior, I could never think of something like that, you know, and it's like, I just love that kind of work too. And that is something that you do get that more from being in group shows than, than just being out there looking at work alone, you know, because when you get to know an artist, then you, you're like, oh, what is that about? Like, let me think more about that way of working. And um, yeah, and so hopefully, um, yeah, hopefully like you've gotten some cool ideas about how to use um, sculpture with me, but like more importantly, I think is like this conversation about um, identity and about how to talk about things that make you feel vulnerable is even much more important because, you know, um, when we feel vulnerable, it's really better to lean into it and not be afraid of that rather than to shy away from it and to make that if that if something's making you feel vulnerable or scared right now, like open that thing up. And it's like, I guarantee you, it's not as scary as you thought so. Even if it comes to like, you know, in my work too, I share a lot about my personal trauma in my work. And every time I've opened that up, it's been way more re rewarding and generative than anything vulnerable about it. Any kind of secret that I've ever shared has made me feel more empowered than, than disempowered as well. So... So that's what this is all about right now is like you guys are in a generation that has to like change the world. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no small order. Well, you guys, we just have a couple minutes left. Does anybody have any questions or for Rebecca before she goes? I do want to say that you're just like as like when you're attaching those um, pieces together, you do a great job. Um, with kind of just blending them and stealing them. Anybody have any questions? I kind of had a question, but you sort of answered it in the beginning. I was like, how does an artist on their own kind of deal with not having a kiln? Like, or access to one, like immediate access? Yeah. I mean, you know, this, this piece here, even though it's small and compact, the way that I built these arms, I wouldn't have built them out like that if I wasn't close to the kiln. This one I made close to the kiln. This lady here, I built her knowing that I'm going to have to transport this to the kiln. I purposely made her, well, she's got this connection that's a little bit weird right here. I might even fill that in where I normally wouldn't, right? I might, I might fill in that hole Just with for that, clay. the added support. Yeah. yeah. You mean fill it in with clay instead of adding like, instead of adding like a foam or something, you mean literally fill it in with clay. I might, because it's, it's just a really, it's a little bit vulnerable. It's holding up the whole head. So I could fill, I could even like change the pose a little bit to be like, instead of like this, it's more like this, you know? Um, so I might go through this and just like really, really clamp down on myself to make it a little bit more compacted, which is not ideal. Okay. But right. I do really enjoy working at my studio sometimes. So adapting things in this way, like I made this one in my studio, this is super compact, you know, yeah. and I still feel it's a really satisfying sculpture, you know? Um, but of course I need to sometimes be in a place where I can work near the kiln so I can do more wild things, you know? Um, but I'm not always working in clay. And that might be an option for you guys too, but right now, if you're like super invested in clay, just keep going, you know, like bust it while you're near a kiln, by the way, also bust moves, make a lot of work. You know, you have, a, you have uh, the ability to like really control it and, and like, you can like, you can even build another great way to work is I have a kiln shelf right here too. I could build my work on a kiln shelf, still cover it, bring it to the kiln that way. Right. What I'll do here is I'm going to wrap it up with a lot of bubble wrap and things and I'll wrap it when it's leather hard and bring it over there and dry it at my friend's studio where she has a kiln. I have a friend who's only, um, 
a short Uber ride away. Let's not lie. I am not taking the subway with this thing. I'm taking it in a box in an Uber very close by. And I'm not taking a whole bunch of pieces at once. Like I put them in a crate. And I'm super, super cautious about it. You know, I, I made a whole series for a friend. Like I was, I was her studio assistant and I did slip casting. Those pieces were not as, those were not an issue at all. Slip casting, easy to transport as well. So tons of solutions if you end up in a situation where you're not near a kiln to work, you know? Well, thank well, you. Yeah, that answered that. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca, for joining us this morning. That was so much fun. I um, and shoot me a note at any time if you guys um want to know anything or you know if we think of something else, I'll send you a couple quotes and stuff too. Cool. Great um, to meet you guys. All right, nice well, meeting you, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Thank you.